the Premier League is back. Now, for more than two months after sports stopped and after weeks of round-the-clock discussions with medical experts and professional sports bodies, I'm delighted to announce today that the government has published guidance which allows competitive sport to resume behind closed doors from Monday at the earliest, and crucially, only when it's safe to do so. But is it safe to do so? There's evidence to suggest it might be too early. Lifting the lockdown was, we were told, dependent on the R rate falling below one and crucially keeping it there. It split the country into regions, and we now know the average number a person can infect is not universally low enough. The national R number, the rate at which the virus is being passed on, remains unchanged between 0.7 and 0.9 for the whole of the UK. But new estimates suggest that some regions are higher than that, with one in the southwest and 1.01 in the northwest. Today, we speak with Labour MP and Shadow Minister for Sport, Alison McGovern, to discuss if now is the right time to bring back the Premier League and how the coronavirus pandemic will impact the futures of the EFL and women's football. Football, tennis, horse racing, Formula One, cricket, golf, rugby, snooker and others are all set to return to our screens shortly, with horse racing first out of the gate in the North East next week. It's been a huge challenge to get to this point. We've taken a forensic, clinician-led approach, working with Public Health England and the Department of Health every step along the way. On May 30th, the Secretary of State for Digital Culture, Media and Sport, Oliver Dowden, announced the return of live sport to the UK. What was your reaction to his announcement? Positive insofar as sport is really, really important. As a group of opposition politicians, we've tried to be constructive in our criticism. And prior to the announcement, focusing specifically on football and and Project Restart to recommence the Premier League. I had corresponded with the government regarding their safety advice and their health advice. So I would say supportive, but with caveats in the sense of I would not wish the government or the sporting authorities to do anything that was counter to uh, the health imperative of the situation we face. However, sport is an incredibly important part of our national life. So if we are able to recommence sport, then that's obviously a cause for for happiness so long as it is done in a way that is absolutely safe. Just to give some context to that, I think the problem that we have is that on the way into lockdown, there are sporting events that people still have questions about, whether that's the Liverpool FC Atletico game. I don't believe that this government really and truly know what they're doing. I wouldn't listen to them. And I'm terrified. So basically, why we're on today, I mean, you know, we're hoping that... An inquiry. A full inquiry will be reached um, to why this game went ahead. Or the horse racing at Cheltenham. I still think there's some questions for the government on that. And so that's why it's really important, I think, that the government step up and are all the more transparent about what they're doing and why. Have they been transparent to you? Have they released kind of their scientific findings that underpin this recent announcement? No, they replied to my questions, but without giving that full detail. So I think that that scrutiny will continue. And I know that, you know, we have select committees in the House of Commons that also do very detailed scrutiny of the way that government takes decisions. And I would be surprised if that further questions weren't asked. You know, want to see uh, sport do everything it can to be in a place where leagues can continue or, you know, in, in the we've got the cricket having found a way to start as well within the guidance. And I think that's a good thing, but... I would just ask that the government do it in a way that builds trust and confidence, because unless you're prepared to be open and share details. 
people are inevitably going to be skeptical about what's really going on unless you're fully transparent. Lifting the lockdown was, we were told, dependent on the R rate falling below one and crucially keeping it there. It split the country into regions and we now know the average number a person can infect is not universally low enough. Yeah, and this is going on with, you know, a pretty big public health backdrop. You know, the same day that Dowden made that announcement, the Association of Directors of Public Health said that, quote, they are increasingly concerned that the government is misjudging this balancing act and lifting too many restrictions too quickly. And as of yesterday, there were 324 deaths in the UK, which is much worse than Germany was when the Bundesliga was coming back. It appears from the outside that we're not really done with this public health crisis. And yet the government is kind of saying that we're still ready to get stuff back. Does it feel to you like we're rushing it a little bit still? I think that it feels to me like we don't have enough information about the way that which the government has taken the decisions. So that's my scrutiny point. It also feels to me like we're just at the beginning of this. I mentioned the cricket, that's yet to happen, but that you know involves far fewer people than, for example, the football leagues do. I think we've seen training taking place and now move forward to, to kind of more bigger training arrangements. And I still think it's possible that, you know, the health situation will mean that the thing slows down. So I don't think we should take anything for granted because of the reasons that you mentioned. We are in a very, very challenging public health environment. And I guess the issue that we've got as well is that it's not just what happens to leagues that were underway. At some point, we have to start to think about future seasons and how the game moves forward. So I guess my message to the government would be, we can't take anything for granted here. We don't know what's going to happen to the virus in the British context. We're still at that point where the transmission and the rate of infection seems to be falling, but that's still relatively new and we don't know what's going to happen. So we need to have contingency plans in place just in case, for example, there's a worsening of the outbreak. You know, I would expect when we're thinking about those plans for, particularly in relation to football, when we're thinking about those plans for next season, I mean, I would imagine that the Premier League and others are really trying to think through what would happen in the worst case scenario as well. And we need to do that because we are not out of the woods yet. Several weeks ago, you wrote a letter to Nigel Huddleston, the sports minister, and I'm curious what questions that you had back then do you still have now that you'd like him to answer? The central point is the transparency one. So the, many of the questions that I wrote were basically asking for information to be put in the public domain. And the reason for that was exactly as I've said, just to build trust and confidence, let it be scrutinized, let the the culture and sports select committee go through it all from an independent point of view and see what they think. So I think they could go further on that, if I'm honest. Why do you think, um, wait, just to interrupt you, why do you think they're hesitant to publish that? Um, I'm, I don't know. I guess, I, I genuinely don't know. I, because I think that we've had this debate more broadly over the scientific advice that government is relying upon and... I think I would say that the lesson learned is that you need to spend a lot of time building up people's confidence in what you're doing. And I think there is a lot of scepticism at the moment. A uh, polling company has been tracking trust in the government, and we've seen some really steep falls in levels of trust in the government. And that's absolutely mission critical, because if the government is asking people to act in a way that is sometimes uninstinctive, and very much against the way that people normally live their lives in the UK, then they need to trust that the government is taking the right decision for all of, as a society. And it takes time and effort to build up that trust. So I'm not entirely sure why the government wouldn't want to try and do that. In England, there's a third element, which is the police, who are responsible to issue a safety certificate to stadiums uh, and, and, and football venues. Now, sometimes they do this, or usually they do this on a local level. In this case, they came out and they did it on a national level. 
Uh, and it's a decision that was also criticized by, by former police and law enforcement types as well. But they did this based on the idea, if you allow teams to play at their home matches, there is a risk that supporters will congregate outside and, and therefore, you know, help spread uh, the, the coronavirus or possibly... You're an MP representing Whirl South, which is located right next to Liverpool. And the national police have expressed concern about fans gathering outside of certain games I know you're well aware that there's an Everton-Liverpool derby coming up that may decide the title. What are your thoughts on police suggestions that neutral venues may be necessary due to kind of their lack of faith in football fans? Well, as I said before, at the risk of sounding like a broken record on this, the first and most important principle is health. Is, you know, we do nothing to put at risk the situation in containing the virus and minimising transmission of the virus. I don't think we should do anything that puts that at risk. But I guess the point that's been made is a bit of a different one, which is about leasing. And my experience as a supporter has been that if you treat supporters like adults and you engage with them and talk to them about what's needed from a policing point of view, then for the most part, people will understand that. And like everybody in society generally does, I mean, We have a principle of policing by consent in the UK, and broadly speaking, it works well. So, you know, with with exceptions, but broadly speaking, it works well. And that's the most important thing. I think if we've got concerns about fans turning up at games, engage with supporters, listen to them, and, and take it from there, really. I think that, you know, there could be other reasons. Like, for example, it's not just the police that make the decision on venues. Public health officials will be involved as well. And they might have other reasons for considering which venues should be used. But as long as everybody sticks to the principle of getting the season finished in a way that protects health, then I think that we'll see a way through. Are you a fan of football today? Then why not support the show and sign up to our new Patreon page? You'll get access to bonus episodes, full interviews and extra content. Just go on Patreon and search football today. Now back to the episode. In Dowden's address last weekend, he said that there were two challenges for the Premier League to come back. I set two challenges for football's return. First, that a reasonable number of remaining Premier League games would be broadcast free to air. And second, that the financial benefits of returning would be shared throughout the entire football family. I want to focus on that second challenge. How do you interpret that statement, that financial benefits of returning would be shared throughout the entire football family? Well, the Premier League have advanced some of their financial support that they would have provided in the months and years to come to the rest of their footballing pyramid. They haven't given extra money. That's an advance on what they would have got anyway. And I think that's, you know, that's a starting position because we know that the rest of the football pyramid does need support. But if I may, I think... Personally speaking, I think we have to look at this as a fundamental issue of reform because the system that we have at the moment for the way that clubs and the lower leagues function financially, I don't think works. I think too many of the clubs are at risk and we need a a fundamental review of how football finances work. We've seen a number of clubs, notably Bury, Bolton, also Real FC in North Wales, has now shut down. We've seen a number of clubs fail, essentially. And that's not fair to those supporters who love their club just like everybody else does. We need governance arrangements that mean that uh, we have a really robust test around who can own a football club, and we need financial arrangements that are sustainable. And I think there are there are really good reforms that we could look for in the medium term to make that a reality. Interestingly, the Conservative Party, not my party, the, the party of government, um, I'm an opposition member of parliament, but the Conservative Party had in its manifesto in the December election a reform of the type that I described. So I'm even hopeful that we might get a bit of cross-party discussion and action on this subject once the immediate threat of the virus is is gone. But I think basically there's always been a mechanism for top flight football to redistribute some of their broadcast income to the lower leagues. And I think, you know, from what the government have said, they expect that principle to be maintained. And I certainly would too. The only thing I would add is that is no substitute for a 
more fundamental reform of the system. You mentioned that there are specific reforms that you're interested in. What are those? Uh, can you be a little bit more specific? Sure. So the owners and directors test that the Premier League applies as for who can own a Premier League football club, I think does need to be looked at. For, for some time, I and Labour colleagues have argued for more and better transparency about who clubs uh, are owned by and the financial arrangements. I think supporters, there's lots of football supporters, they're large in number, they are really important stakeholders to football clubs and too often it can be really hard for them to find out financial information and details about how their club is being run and I think that they are entitled to that transparency. And I think that also we need to make sure that the football leagues can still function as a like a proper pyramid where it is possible for clubs to work their way up the league. And at the moment, we have too many cliff edges, so it's too hard to break into top flight football. And I think that there are many people within football who have, you know, within the leagues or running clubs, who've got good ideas for reform. So I think what we need to see is, is the government bring forward a review process and a consultation. And then, I, as I say, I would be ambitious and hope that we could get cross-party agreement on what some of those reforms look like. We are heading for a financial hole of about £200 million by the end of September. We need a rescue package, but I do think we also, in the same time, need to address the longer term. We can't just go from one bailout to another bailout. We have to look at the structure and assess it, root and branch. Parry told MPs an overhaul of English football finances was now required, including a redistribution of revenues to bridge the chasm between the Premier League and the rest. The end of parachute payments to relegated clubs, calling them an evil that must be eradicated. A salary cap to stop ridiculous spending by clubs. And Huddersfield's owner, Phil Hodgkinson, thinks that as many as 50 or 60 clubs could go bust in the coming months and you know year, because obviously this isn't just a short-term issue, but an issue for next season as well. Rochdale has already secured a loan from their local council to kind of stay afloat in this time. Who should be responsible for ensuring that those clubs stay financially afloat, you know, in the coming months and, you know, even years? I think, I don't think there's one answer to that. I think at this moment in time, we need good coalitions. I think that local authorities do have a really important role to play Um, You've mentioned Rochdale, but also in the cases that we've seen of other clubs in financial difficulties, the public sector in in different guises has tried to find ways to work in partnership with football clubs to help use their potential to realise some of the aims that local and, and government more broadly has. And so I don't think there's one answer. I don't think there's like a a fixed way of approaching it because football clubs across the country are all quite different. But I think what you need is a partnership of the local government, the local community. A lot of supporters also have been really effective in forming themselves into trusts so that they're able to play a role in the governance as well. So I, I would advocate that kind of partnership But kind of on the whole, we just need a little bit more structural reform. Is that what you're kind of indicating? Yes, I think we definitely need structural reform. I think we should start from the principle that no one should lose a well-loved sports club because of this virus and that we should be able to find different ways to get sports clubs through this situation. Many of them have used the government's furlough scheme to support their staff to, you know, help with the wage bill. That's a good thing. Um, Others will have received support in different ways, be that from their supporters or from other institutions. I think, as I say, that in the medium term, we need to have a good look at football finances and work out a way that we can make sure that clubs are put on a more sustainable footing. I think that there are a number of examples of where we all wish that somebody had been able to step in sooner to a club. And so we need to take the lessons from from those experiences and work out a structure that means that they are not likely to happen again. Now 
it's been one of the darkest periods in the history of women's football in England. And it now means that all divisions of the women's game in England have been cancelled this season. So we'll be discussing what the future holds for the women's game. Earlier, we talked about how the Premier League was coming back. But on the flip side, we know that the end of the Women's Super League season has been cancelled. Should we be bringing back the Premier League when the Women's League isn't coming back? The problem with the way that what's happened with the Women's League is that it feels that it's been a mistake to just cancel the Women's League without a broader plan to demonstrate how we're going to make sure that the women's game gets the kind of promotion and the kind of investment that it really deserves. So I think it's perfectly reasonable for the FA or others to say, well, from a practical point of view, it works better for us to cancel the league. But here's the plan we have together to make sure that we're taking every opportunity to promote the women's game. And that, you know, we've interrogated the current situation and we think the best opportunities for women's game are this and this and this. So what I would like now is to move forward pretty quickly to that situation where the government and the FA and the clubs that that has planned for the women's game. I just think if you look at the amount of time and effort that's gone into Project Restart for the Premier League, if we had that kind of time and effort and resource put into making a plan for the women's game so that the the momentum and the, the kind of sense of importance of the women's game isn't lost. If we had the kind of project restart level effort for the women's game, then I think we'd really be motoring. But at the moment, it doesn't feel like enough. Last year, the FA had an operating profit of £63 million and an overall turnover of £467 million. It is technically a not-for-profit association. Does it have a financial responsibility to do more to assess the women's game during this time? I mean, they could have, you know, put together the entire league and financed it themselves, the FA. Well, I think, you know, it's interesting. um, You mentioned the Bundesliga before, and it's interesting that actually it's been reported that the Bundesliga has supported the German women's game, as I understand it, to to the tune of $2 million to uh, get them through the coronavirus situation. So, I think I would definitely look to what others have done as inspiration. In many ways, I would applaud the FA for their approach, particularly on grassroots women's game. Like they have doubled the number of women playing football over recent years. And that is an incredible achievement. And I wouldn't hold back any praise for them on that. I would just like to see more impetus and more, you know, it's not for me to say, you know, what the financial details should or shouldn't be. What I have is an ambition for the women's game, and I would just like to work with the FA and the government to realise that ambition. What questions do you want answered most in the coming days, weeks and months? I would say three things. Firstly, grassroots and participation because we talked about the fragility financially of some clubs, which is a really big and important issue. Add to that the situation that a lot of grassroots teams face, which is they've really had training restricted and it's been a very challenging time for them to get through. And the other side of it is we've seen people in lockdown doing more physical activity, some people, and really enjoying being able to get out and play sports. So we need to maximise that impetus that people have. So I think priority number one would be grassroots and you know inclusion in people's participation in sport priority number two would definitely be women we know that through coronavirus women disproportionately have been the ones who have done less sport and physical activity so we know there's a gender dimension to what's going on at the moment and finally on the premier league you know i hope that what takes place and the way that the league is dealt with i hope that that can be done absolutely safely without infection risk and without any any challenges and I think the way that way to do that is to take it step by step take it slowly make sure that all of the arrangements for uh, securing people against the infection are actually working and if that doesn't seem to be the case you know slow down or don't proceed but do it in a safe way Um, and then people people will be able to enjoy it if they know that it's safe so that would be my last one.
Alison McGovern is a Labour MP representing Rural South and is the UK's Shadow Minister for Sport. You can follow her Twitter account for ongoing news related to sport in the UK. This episode was produced by John McKenzie. I'm Josh Schneider-Weiler, and thanks for listening to Football Today.